this is Paleoc, and in this tutorial we are going to go over stereo imaging and sound localization. We're going to talk about how humans can localize sound in 3D space, not just left and right, but also forwards and backwards, and try to delve into how we can do y-axis panning instead of just x-axis. Um, and then we're going to build this stereo imaging device where uh, it you can map items in space using polar coordinates. So you take the angle of something and the radius away from the listener that you want that object to be, and then you can map them around. So I have this sound here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to automate the angle of it. So you can think of uh, this is a little visual representation. Uh, this is to the right of you, this is the left of you, this is in front of you, and this is behind you. And so by automating this distance knob, we can make it so that it gets very close to you and then recedes away into the distance. And uh, as it does that, it's going to be Doppler shifted based on how fast it's moving towards and away from you, as well as you can automate the angle. So. I think that sounds pretty cool. And then there's also the option to turn on binaural mode. So if you're listening in mono or even on some stereo systems and you're not wearing headphones, this might sound weird, but wearing headphones has a very cool effect. So I made a little ambient piece here and uh, it's got a lot of cool stereo imaging techniques going on. So if you pay attention to this dude, the background. This is the location of it. I'd like to take a quick moment to advertise my Patreon. For $15 a month, you can have access to sample packs and uh, sound generating racks, and as well as all of the racks that I've covered in these videos, as well as the stereo imaging rack that we're about to build right now. So uh, if you'd like to financially support the channel, then uh, this is probably the best way to do so. Uh, I also am teaching private lessons and I have mixing and mastering services if you're interested in any of that. So to start off, we are going to go to the Wikipedia page for sound localization. This is a rabbit hole. Highly advise you like read through it, click on a bunch of links, learn about how our ears actually work. It's super interesting. Um, but basically when we localize sound, we're using primarily two different functions. We're using the time difference, which is how the difference in time between when it takes a sound to reach your right ear versus your left ear. So for instance, if there's, if there's something being played to the right of you, it's going to hit your right ear first, and then about 0.7 milliseconds later, it's going to hit your left ear. And then that creates a phase difference between the two sounds and your brain can locate it. The level difference, the actual volume of it, is going to be relatively the same. And uh, when you're panning something in Ableton, for instance, um, hard panning is not actually a realistic interpretation of how sounds move around you. Because the only time in nature something actually is like much louder in one ear versus the other is when like a bug flies right by your ear or something because it has to be physically really close for there to be like a large decibel difference there has to be a relatively large distance difference between the two items so uh let's open up ms paint do a classic little paint thing so let's say this is that's you got a funny nose and then this is your ear this is your other ear and let's say there is an object that is about the distance between your two ears away. And so let's call this distance D, and then let's call this distance 2D. And so what this means is 
since sound drops off by six decibels for every time you double the distance away from the source, what this means is that there's going to be a minus six decibel difference between the left and right ear in this case. Uh, if you have an object that is, I don't know, over here, then we could call that prime. Uh, and then the distance between here and here is just going to be a little bit more. Let's say like 1.2 E prime or something. Um, the volume difference between the left and right speaker in this case is only going to be like one decibel or something. It, it drops off very quickly, uh, the difference. So the only time there's actually like a large audible volume difference between your left and right ear is when something's very close to you, which, I mean, you could still use that to great effect, um, especially if the rest of your sounds aren't being hard panned, because then you can, like, really surprise the listener in that regard. Now, there is also the, yeah, the time difference, so there's going to be uh, about a 0 0.7 millisecond delay in between the sound hitting this ear and the sound hitting this ear. So when the sound, if the sound is, let's say this is uh, behind you, this is in front of you. The sound is right in front of you. Uh, it's going to reach both ears at the exact same time. There is no time difference. The sound is right here. It's going to hit this ear first, and it's going to hit this one 0.7 milliseconds later. Same thing on the other side. If it's over here, then it's going to hit the sounds at a little bit of a different timing. It's going to hit it in between 0 0.7 milliseconds and 0 milliseconds. And I, I mean, it's probably like the square root of 2 over 2 times 0 0.7, because that is, that's the like x-axis distance at this angle. Um, and so we're probably going to end up using uh, circles or the spellbook max device, which I'll explain later. For some of this, if you want to create like a realistic um, polar coordinate mapping system for sound localization. So let's go in here and let's take uh, this. All right, it's at minus 13, and then I'm going to pan it so that, there we go. So the left, left, left speaker is still at about minus 13, and then the right speaker is now hitting at about minus 18. So this is about, about roughly a successful difference. So this is, this is an, an object making sound one head worth away from you about like 11 centimeters away from you to your left. So that's not that much actual panning. If you hard pan even more, this is like the equivalent of something being a, a mosquito like flying right by your ear or, you know, maybe it's in your ear. That's something fun to think about. Now, if you look back at the Wikipedia page, you'll notice that uh, it describes the interaural intensity difference or level difference. Um, is not just the volume difference based on distance, but also the volume difference for every individual frequency because your head will create an acoustic shadow for your right ear. So the higher end frequencies will be absorbed before reaching your other ear. So you're going to have this kind of a filter going on. And so uh, I did a lot of digging. There's some varying answers. This isn't like, well studied that I can find, at least freely available on the internet, but uh, I found this research paper and they, these are measurements taken for children. Now keep in mind, children's heads are different than adults, but uh, this is just for like a basic approximation. This is on average how the child's head would shadow the uh, alternate ear for sounds that are being played. So if you play sound to the left of the child, then the right ear is going to end up absorbing something like this. Now, these are measurements taken from a bunch of them, and notice that is an extremely variable amount. Now, this is the issue with all this, you know, stereo imaging and trying to create, like, realistic sound localization experiences for a listener, is it's pretty much impossible. Every single listener has a very different set of ears, um, and how we interpret and localize sound is based on so many different genetic factors. So, uh, you know, like the size and structure of your ears matter, um, the size of your head, the distance between your ears matter, the, the shape and size of your own torso will absorb and attenuate different frequencies, and that also plays a huge role. Um, it's 
just extremely convoluted and it's impossible to generalize for everyone. There are some ways to get around this for specific instances. So people have created head-related transfer functions or HRTFs, which are essentially someone creates a mapping for every single angle in three-dimensional space around someone's head and plays sounds around it and then records the filtering and phase difference data for every single one of those points and every single frequency. Now it's a shit ton of data just for one subject and it only works for them. Now, theoretically, if you're able to do that, you could localize and create sounds that are like located below you and above you and 20 degrees to the right and moving side to side and in front and behind you. And that can be really cool, but it's not gonna work for anyone else but the person that it's made for, which is just really sad, honestly. But you can still apply those general principles to loosely recreate or suggest movement that's happening forwards and backwards and side to side and above and below. So um, we're gonna talk about that. Uh, I got a little bit distracted. So uh, I'm gonna take all this data and I'm gonna create a, I'm gonna try to create a rack such that I can take one knob and spin it, and that one knob is going to move the uh, sound source in a circle around the listener. And thus, it's going to, as it moves around, it's going to shadow or filter the frequencies differently, depending on if it's on the right and left side. Um, there's going to be an option for toggling time delay that you can turn on and off because that's going to introduce phase differences and phase cancellation. Uh, so you can choose if you want to use it binaurally or not. And then there's also going to be some filtering differences between whether it's in front of you or behind you. And then uh, that way you can get, um, you can create some sort of like depth. And then we're going to work with adding like Doppler effects and Doppler shifting so that we can create some like drastic movement for like uh, something moving very quickly past you, behind you or in front of you. So uh, to start off, um, I have these cool sounds that I made that fill kind of the frequency spectrum. That's fun. So uh, first I uh, got my EQ and then I'm gonna pull up this uh, head shadow data that I looked at. So um, what we need to do is we need to approximate uh, what this is doing. Uh, with the EQ8. Now keep in mind, this needs to be an approximation because what we're looking at is the just a shit ton of different data points. All of these are wildly different. Like look, even one kid's frequency data went up here. Like, weird. So uh, we just have to be doing something following along that curve, right? So you'll notice uh, here, I'm going to turn all of these into nodes like that. And then uh, I'm going to turn on oversampling mode. That way you can be a little bit more exact uh, with the filters. And so this says at negative 7,000, we have like a tw minus 20 decibel uh, increase, which is, or decrease, which is kind of huge. But um, I mean, that's just down here. It also, it ranges from like minus 10 to minus 20. And then at 1,000, we have like minus 5. And then uh, 2,000, no, 4,000, we're at like minus 10 or so. So minus 4,000. It, it goes up a little bit at around 10 to, 10 to 12,000, which that's kind of what this is doing. And then it's going to drop back down. Yeah. Um, this looks, that looks kind of close enough, right? Uh, so if we set this to left-right mode, that means the left, I'm filtering the left one, so the right ear is going to be unfiltered. Therefore, this should be, we're going to hear this to our right. And then uh, with it not at all, the center. Uh, we can also throw this on white noise here. Then we can get the full frequency spectrum. So without it, with it, just pan a little bit, you know? Now, uh, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna open this up and then I'm going to try to create uh, 
a way to shift this between the left and right speaker. So to do that, uh, I'm going to turn this into a rack, and then I'm going to map scale right here. I'm going to make this go from I'm going to make this go from 100 negative 100. Right now, the reason why I did this is because I want the center to be zero. I'm never going to have this audibly go to negative 100, but I need it to be there so that the center is at zero. So from here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a uh, duplicate this. What I'm going to do is uh, the mapping for the scale here is going to go from 100 to negative 100. So I'm inverting it. And then I need to swap this from left mode to right mode. Uh, so, I mean, I could do that by just copying all of the things that I did here, but for the right side instead. But uh, I'm lazy. And what we can do instead is we can use a utility. So we're going to swap the left and right speaker before we come in. Then we're going to apply the left frequency panning to it. And then we're going to swap it again. So what we're doing now is we're putting the right speaker to where the left is modulating the left speaker and then putting it back where the right is. And so in fact, we just swap the sides of where these filtering is going to go. And since we inverted the scale for the left and right one, um, what happens is when this is up, the other one's going to be down and vice versa. When this is down, the other one's going to be up. Then we can use a chain selector. I'm going to drag this up to about halfway, 64. I'm going to drag this all the way up here. Mix this up. I want to put this here and here. And then I'm going to also map the chain selector as well. So now you have a headshot of hand. LR hand. So, uh, just in summary, uh, this knob switches the scale from uh, 100 to negative 100, which inverts it. However, we have it set so that whenever this goes to start going into the negatives, which we don't want, it switches to an alternate side, which is pan to the other side, and then does the inverse. Okay, so I want a knob that instead of moving left to right, I want it to move this in a circle so that I can start affecting behind it and in front of the listener. So I'm going to use the spellbook. So the Hypnos Spellbook is a Max for Live device uh, that is a two-dimensional multi-mapping LFO. So the x-axis and the y-axis can be mapped to different parameters, and then this dot is going to trace around the shape that you can modulate, and you can spin the shape in interesting ways, and then uh, wherever the dot is on the x and y-axis is going to be mapped to those parameters. Uh, I use it all the time. It's in all my other videos, pretty much. Uh, I highly recommend you get it. It costs like $20. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this to be sync. I'm going to reset and everything. So I'm going to set read to off. So it is fixed at the top. And then what I can do is if I offset, the spin is going to move around in a circle. So essentially, I've just turned this into a like circular polar panner thing, where the x-axis is going to be a sine wave, and the y-axis is going to be a cosine wave. And then I can choose where along the sine and cosine wave I want this to be. So the x-axis is uh, what we're focusing on right now. So you can see the dot is in the center, therefore this is in the center, right? And then as I spin this, right, I'm gonna name this head shadow and and then um I map that. I'm gonna put this in a group. I'm gonna put this inside the group that the head shadow pan is in. Um and then I'm going you map this, and then within this group, I'm also going to map this to hard panning. And then what we can do from here is uh, I'm going to map spin offset here. And then I'm going to map the range for the hard pan here. So with the range cranked all the way up, this is going to hard pan everything. Right? This one off. But you can lower this just to have it affect the source a little bit to help nudge it. So, you know, if it's at like 10%, uh, this is gonna end up hard panning like 6R. I don't I don't know how many decibels that corresponds to. But you can imagine that 
The further that this is cranked to 100, the closer it is to your head, spinning around your head. If you imagine that your head is right here, in the center of this little spinny thing. You know, the closer it is, the further away it is from your head. Right? Like, I can imagine that actually sounding like it's from a distance. And oh, this is much closer. Now, let's start working with delay times if you want to get binaural. Put the delay here. And I'm going to unsync both sides because we're going to be delaying both ears differently. I'm going to set this to one millisecond. So... Uh, the left ear at its max is going to be hearing about 0.7 milliseconds later than the right ear. So what we're going to do is we're going to map of these. These are all on the x-axis because we're still working on just, you know, left and right stereo. Um, and so when this is all the way over here, I want... We're going to be panning them slightly differently. So uh, we're going to hit this inverse button. And so now you'll notice when this is over here, that means that the right is actually going to be at the max, which is selected here. And the left is going to be at the min, which is, you know, one millisecond. And we can adjust the range until we make it so that the max is 1.7 or so. Right, uh, and then let's do that for this side as well, 34.5. And now, you'll notice as we spin this around, you have an extremely realistic binaural panning experience. Because as, you know, when its spin offset is here, it's delayed such that the right ear is receiving the signal 0.7 milliseconds later. And then when it's here, it's the other way around. So now you have a binaural panner. Cool. So, and then we can add a little bit of part pan also. So, uh, all right, I took some chords. <laughs> And then uh, with the head shadow pan and the time difference, it now, with these effects, when I'm wearing headphones, it sounds like it's actually in the room with me, which can be a cool effect. And so now uh, I want to add a y-axis movement. I want to try to simulate it being in front of me and behind me. Now, for the reasons I described earlier, this is almost impossible to do completely accurately. Uh, you need to use like head-related transfer functions, and it's very different for everyone. But you can kind of get it going by making there to be a difference in timbre between the front and behind speaker. Now, the listener might not technically know what front is and what behind is. But they'll know there's a difference when you move it around in space between when it's in front and behind. So, um, well, one, there's a few ways we could do it. We could just make it so that the front is louder and behind is quieter, aka implying that instead of panning around in a circle, it's kind of moving around in an oval, and therefore, like, behind is further away. So, if we take, uh, let me take this utility. And I'm going to map the gain, and then I'm going to set the max of the gain to be 0. And then I'm going to map Spellbook to this, and I'm going to set this to be the Y parameter. And so now this is saying when it's behind you completely, it's completely silent. And then when it's in front of you, it's at 0. Now, I don't want it to go all the way quiet. I want it to be, I just want it to get a little bit more quiet, maybe like minus six decibels or something. So you can just mess with the range and the offset and nudge it around in such a way that it does that. And so, yeah, like here, yeah, about minus, minus seven, minus eight or so is the max.
So I'm going to turn on spin rate. And then uh, I'm also going to map turning the delay on and off so that we can turn on binaural. Because when you're using binaural stuff, it's going to be phase cancellation. You might not necessarily want that. You probably don't want that in most cases, um, unless you're using it for like ear candy and stuff. Things that don't really matter as much when they uh, are converted into mono and then are comb filtered and lose some volume. So uh, I guess let's talk about that. So uh, what is comb filtering exactly? Comb filtering is the effect that happens when you delay a signal by just a tiny bit. And then the fr some frequencies are going to end up canceling with others because when you delay one frequency by a tiny bit, it is going to effectively just move the phase uh, at sometimes 180 degrees. And uh, it creates a filter called a comb filter because it looks like a comb in the frequency range. So uh, let's demonstrate this. So uh, let's take delay down the white noise. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create and make another delay. This delay is going to be one millisecond is once. And so since they're both one millisecond, uh, this means nothing's happening. If I make this one two milliseconds, this is actually a two, one millisecond delay between the signals because this one is set to one millisecond, right? So you'll see when it's one millisecond, this is a comb. Now the mathematics for how this happens uh, basically, if you think about a 100 hertz sine wave, 100 hertz means it's oscillating at 100 times per second, which means they have a 10 millisecond wavelength because there are a thousand milliseconds in a second. So 10 milliseconds is one one hundredth. So if it has a 10 millisecond period, sorry, not wavelength, 10 millisecond period then that means if you offset the entire sound, the 100 hertz sine wave, by 5 milliseconds, half of 10 milliseconds, you're going to be offsetting the phase by 50%, aka inverting the phase. And so if we set this to be 6 milliseconds, because 6 milliseconds minus 1 millisecond is 5, this means there's a 5 millisecond difference, we're going to see a comb filter where 100, mil 100 hertz is going to be filtered and then also other multiples of that are going to be filtered because those multiples um, will also repeat with the same cycle. So you can see 100 hertz is filtered, 300 hertz, 500 hertz. So it seems like all of the odd harmonics end up getting filtered. It creates a comb filtering effect, which gets thinner as you go into the higher regions because the frequency range is logarithmic and not linear. So uh, that's basically how it works. Now, when you are, let's say, let's say you have one sound pan, hard left and hard right. So we have. Like that sounds really cool in headphones. However, if you sum that to mono. Uh, you can hear comb filter. And so the way that you get around that is um, depending on the sound that you use, you're going to have to tune what the delay is so that it works more compatibly with your sound. It's mostly just tuning by ear. And then in effect, what you could do is take the sound and then minimize the amount of loss for that sound. There's always going to be some loss and it's just really highly dependent on the sound that you're using. Um, there's a really good video by Dan Worrell uh, explaining how to use hostile, which that's what this is pretty much, uh, and how to properly manage and use this while mixing. And you can even use it to make your mixes better. Like the example that he gives is that let's say you have a bunch of elements in like the 100 to 300 hertz range and they're all kind of interfering well if you pan one away from the rest of the elements using delays in stereo space it has it's separated and so it makes more sense and fits nicer and then when you convert it down to mono you can tune the delays such that the frequency range where they're congested gets canceled out a bit for that sound so it actually 
EQs the sound for you when converted to mono, and then when in stereo, it's spread beautifully in stereo space. So, um, I highly recommend checking that out. I'll put links in the, the, door, the description and stuff. But, uh, yeah, that's um, how comb filters work. Now, when you look at the human ear, uh, behold my incredible drawing ability. So, let's say this is ear, and then there's like, I don't know, I actually don't know all that much about ear. Let's say there's a bunch of grooves and shit. When sound, let's say this is your ear hole, uh, sound is gonna go into it. It's also gonna bounce around and hit here, and then bounce around and go into here, and then this is gonna be delayed by some slight amount. And then this here is also gonna bounce and be delayed by some slight amount. And then basically the sound is gonna be hitting your ear in a million different ways. And all of those different ways are going to end up being reflected by the pinna, the structure of your ear, which is going to create refractions that are slightly delayed that are gonna end up causing comb filtering in really slight amounts. So uh, the easiest way to get a comb filter is just to have like a comb filtering plugin. Like if you use if you have Serum, uh, Serum FX, Serum FX, uh, Serum FX has a comb filter. Which honestly, that's just the easiest way to go about this. When you go to filter, go to misc, and comb, and then. Okay, so you'll notice uh, the comb filter. When it's on, it boosts the volume a lot, which is pretty annoying. So, uh, without Serum FX on, this is at minus 24. With it on, it's at minus 16. Let's adjust the master volume. There. Yeah, that's, that's fine. And so now, so I'm just going to create a dry wet rack with the Serum FX. Just be like that. Dry, I misspelled dry, that's okay. I'm gonna map uh, this chain selector here, drag this out, make that like that, and drag this out and make that like that. And then I move the chain selector along. And then I'm just gonna play a different foam filtering sound. And you can change what the filter is. So then now, uh, we can call the home filter, then put that in our cool stereo rack that we're making. Take our stereo thing, we'll map the Y axis to the filter. But, uh... So, I mean, this really, to me, it really sounds like it's going around my head. Rather than just going left and right. Or, instead of uh, using the serum comb filter, you can create your own comb filter by adding a bunch of delays together. Let's take a delay, and then let's uh, turn into a rack, and then let's map... Um, yeah, let's map the dry-wet. And the feedback and this chain volume here and turn this off one and uh we're gonna create a bunch of duplicates and we're just gonna offset them by a tiny bit so that way all of these are slightly delayed in different ways from everything else you know or right now we're emulating how our ears are reflecting a bunch of different things around then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's get eight so that we can have a power of two. That makes the math a little bit easier. Yeah, sure. So we have eight of these. And if you take two signals that are the same and add them together, you're going to get a six decibel increase. Well, uh, that means if you do it with four signals, you're going to get a 12 decibel increase. And then. 
if you do that again, you're going to get us 18 decibel increase. So let's turn them all down by 18 decibels. Yeah, here's our, this is our code filter. And then increasing the feedback will just basically make everything quote unquote reflect a lot more. Um, so, I mean, we could hear it on for white noise. And light amounts, that's kind of how our head filters stuff. Alright, so we can use this comb filter as well. We'll take uh, uh, the same knob. And now we have a pretty realistic, like, Z axis panning thing. Alright, now I want to add Doppler shift. So I want to be able to move the source closer and further away from the listener and have the pitch be shifted in relation to that. So uh, let's take a quick little look at what Doppler shift is essentially as thing as source moves closer to you, the time it takes for the sound to reach you becomes shorter. And so that movement will compress the sound wave thus shifting it upwards in pitch or lowering it in pitch. Now, I want you to take a second and think about what device in Ableton will do precisely that for you. It's, if, if, if it being highlighted already gave it away, then yep, oh, yep, it did. It's a delay. So, you know, I'm sure you've experienced that. Moving the delay around pitch shifts. That's actually what Doppler shift is. This is like, mathematically Doppler shift. So the MS is the distance from you. If it's one second away, that's one second in the speed of sound, 343 meters away from you. And so if you automate a sound to go from uh, one second down to one millisecond, that's going to be moving towards you at a rate of 343 uh, meters per second if it does it in a second. So the problem here is that uh, the delay knob is not at all linear. Uh, you'll notice if you go between 0 and 50%, it goes from 1 millisecond to 150 milliseconds, and then 50% to 100 is 150 milliseconds to 5 seconds. So it is not linear at all. It's not even like logarithmic. Basically, it's stupid. So uh, what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to try to get around that. Honestly, at this point, I should just learn Max for Live. And create my own nonlinear uh, delay device for Doppler shift, but um, that sounds like effort. So no. So uh, I'm gonna try to pick like a range between 100 and 500 because this is like more linear than the other regions. Yeah, at at the halfway mark, you'll notice at the halfway mark is at 330. I want it to be at three or 230. I want it to be at 300. So something we can try to do is we can use a multi-map, because multi-maps have this cool little curve knob. So if I increase curve, set this at halfway, E4, I can adjust the curve so that this is at about 300. So yeah, there's a, from 100 to 300, 300 to 500, so this this is mostly there. This is mostly linear. It's it's close enough, I think, right? So uh, 32 is 25 percent of the way. It's about 200, and then 64 is about 300, and then 96 is about 400, and then all the way is 500. So it's pretty much linear. So now by twisting this knob here, you're essentially just getting Doppler shift. <laughs> And uh, so this is now effectively a distance knob because this is just saying how long it takes for sound to get to you, aka how far is it away from you, depending on the speed of sound. Now, for it to be a distance knob, we need it to affect more things. Like, for instance, when sounds are far away, they are quieter. So let's get a uh, utility. And let's map the utility 
to here as well. Set the max to be zero. That here. Uh, and then we're going to want to invert this. And then uh, we are going to also want auto filter because sounds that are far away get absorbed by the atmosphere in the higher frequency regions. Um, I spent a long time trying to figure out exactly how many frequencies. It ends up just being like something like that. It's, it's really not that much. And, you know, we're still approximating things in the end. But, uh, yeah, so let's just map that to that. It's going to, at its closest, gonna like that, and furthest away, something like that. All right, and now we're going to want to map what the minimum, or I guess what the max is for the gain. We want to choose how loud the object is. Like, if you still want to hear it at max distance, this is theoretically a really big sound. Right? Because if it's really quiet, then that means you're not going to hear it until it's right up next to you. I guess, I don't know, it, it depends on like your perspective of it. It could also just mean that the space is much larger that you're in. And uh, what's going to designate the Doppler shift is really just how fast you're twisting this knob because it's based on the velocity of the uh, object. So there's another way that humans can localize how close an object is to you. And to do that, they use the room that they're in. So uh, reverb, basically. So, uh, going back to our trusty little paint, um, if you think about this is the source object, this is you, uh, sound hits you, and then the quickest reflections is going to be basically determined by this length. So, this is going to have some, the reverb's going to have some pre-delay before it hits you. And, and this pre-delay can be considered pretty large relative to this line here, right? Now, if the object is, let's say, right very far away from you, next to the, the wall of the room, uh, it's going to it's going to hit you right there, and then it's also the first pre-delay, or the, the first reflection designated by the pre-delay of your reverb, is going to hit you very shortly afterwards. So the farther away the object is from you, the less pre-delay there will be for your reverb, and the closer it is to you, the more pre-delay there will be. So to implement that, uh, let's get ourselves a reverb. I'm use any. I'm going to use Valhalla because Valhalla Vintage Reverb is really good. Um, and then I'm going to turn this into like a send of sorts um, because. Automating pre-delay within Valhalla is a fucking mess. Don't do not do it. It'll sound really muddy and weird. But you could just change the delay before Valhalla. And then um, this can be your pre-delay. That pre-delay up there. And then this is going to be the send volume. Let's make this something sexier. Okay, and then we're gonna map uh, the pre delay this knob here. We'll set the max to be like 100, then map this. And 
And then, so in effect, we can map this here. Reverb send. Name this uh, X. And this is effectively your Doppler shift rack. So we can call this Doppler shift. Then we can take this Doppler shift rack, or I guess it also functions as a distance rack. Um, let's map this knob here. This distance. And then I'm going to put this inside of our main stereo imaging rack. And then I'm going to map uh, distance to be here, gain max to be here, and then the reverb send. So right now it's set so that when uh, spin offset, that 50% were located behind the observer. But I kind of want to have it so that 50% is actually in front of the observer. That way this knob is in the center, kind of like a like a pan knob. And so if I move it to the left, it goes to the left. I move it to the right, it goes to the right. So I'm just going to invert um, all the y-axis things that I mapped, which is just applied to, I guess, the gain and the comb filter. Okay. That's at 50. Uh, now let's um, let's get some cool automation going just to liven up this little percussion loop sound. Yeah. So now with uh with the ITD on. I mean, this is now binaural. Uh, this has an extremely cool effect, I think. Like, I don't know. Let's take let's take some LFOs. Let's make them a little bit random. Let's take this random LFO. Take another one. Make them both smooth. Let's just map that. Do all this shit. Make that really smooth. Now, I want the LFO to pick a point and then jump to it. But I or when it when it switches to a point, I want the smoothness to be even higher than a hundred percent. Like right now, it takes like. A quarter of a second for it to like go to the correct value. I want it to take several seconds so that it like slowly moves around, right? Now, and the LFO is a Max device, and pretty much all Max devices you can actually open up and modify yourself. So, I'm gonna click on this button here. This is gonna open up LFO. It's in presentation mode. Uh, welcome to Max MSP. I don't know that much about Max. I've noodled around a bit. Um, I've made a couple devices, but they're pretty buggy and not that great. But uh, this is a good way to learn it by opening up devices and then fucking with it. So uh, we just have to find smooth. Here's smooth. Smooth. It says 100% times 2. Well, what happens if we make 2 a bigger number? Make it, you know, let's make it 10. Why not? Right? That should probably do what I want it to do. I want, I want to make it more smooth. Now, if this doesn't work, then maybe I'll multiply it by a smaller number, like 0.5. But uh, it's just experimentation. I'm going to hit Control s save I'm going to name this uh, Modified LFO for smoothing. And then I'm going to lock it and hit Freeze Device. And then when you press presentation mode, it goes in and out of this thing. And let's open up Ableton again. But it's still frozen. Why that? We have to exit out completely. Okay, there we go. And would you look at that? It's it takes a very long time for it now go to the correct value that you want. So now we can mount, map this onto here. And now this is just going to very lazily 
go to the spot we want. Let's make another LFO. Can I do that? I right, bug it. Won't let me. Here we go. If I just searched all results modified LFO for smoothing, it came up. Uh, so let's make this really smooth. And then also put this on random. And then let's map one to distance and let's map one to spin offset. You can see it get really close, go far away. So now this is kind of moving around in a really interesting and very large stereo space. And uh, you can start you know, making different sounds. Oh. Okay, so I have this sound going on now. Uh, I want to make it a little bit more weird, and uh, I want to make it a kind of interesting binaural ambient background as a part of this piece that I'm working on. So this just sounds like this. I think this could be an interesting addition to that. To use an echo. Use an echo, and then a character on the echo. I'm gonna make that. I'm gonna set wobble on. And this is just gonna like fuck with the pitch. It's just gonna like wobble the time back and forth like crazy. Chained by this big bass, because I don't want them both playing at the same time. these knobs to be in different positions like I want uh, distance to be next to spin offset because this is essentially the angle and then this is the radius from the center uh, if we convert this into polar coordinates so uh, I'm just gonna unmap that and unmap that swap them this is now hard pan range this is gonna be distance and distance is determined 
over here. And name this angle. And then we can color it. So we'll make these guys both the same color. I like that one. And the very final thing that I'm going to do is uh, you may have noticed that for the Doppler shift to work, the entire signal needs to be delayed by some amount, basically. It's at minimum going to be delayed by 100 milliseconds. And uh, that can be an issue if you're trying to use this and use this as an automation within like a song or a project file. Like this would best be done to like resample or to record sounds with the interesting stereo imaging done and then you could shift it around and cut it and paste it around so if you want to not i'm basically basically you're just going to have the option to turn the doppler shift on and off so to do that i'm just going to map the delay device on thing here and then i'm going to have to map that from here to no you know what i want that to be here next to reverb send so i'm gonna Unmap that there, and then yeah, this map there. Device on gets mapped there, and then reverb send is gonna get mapped there. So this is gonna have the same color as the ITD device on and off. This is Doppler on the off slash on actually. And this is the reverb send. They don't know that color. So now you can just turn Doppler shift on and off. Okay, so now we're pretty much done here. So you're going to take this device and then you're going to toss it in your user library. I have a little stereo imaging folder within it. Um, you can expect a few tutorials in the future going more into stereo imaging and exploring other ways that you can like shift sounds um, around because uh, a lot of the interesting things that you can do in the stereo field is less so about where it's placed in the field but also the movement how it can move from point a to point b so you notice by just involving some pitch shifting with doppler shift you can create really interesting movements in the stereo space that realistically can feel like an object like moving towards you or away from you or passing through you so stay tuned and yeah uh, i hope this was helpful and i need to learn some stuff